You know, as a cliché millennial, I have always wanted a map of New York City. Specifically, a street map. I just think it's a marvel of urban design. And a map of it would look pretty good on the wall above my couch. But I didn't want some boring old map that you get from one of those bookshops that you have to stick on your wall with tape, only to have it fall on you in the middle of the night and give you a strange fear of maps ever since. Oh, no, 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 that's far too basic. I would have to make something, something eye-catching, something 3D, something with shadows, something that would take me several weeks to cut out of paper and that would end up looking so incredibly complicated that it would have anyone who saw it say, oh wow, you did all that? Why? Because I wanted to, Taylor. Because I damn well wanted to. So, buckle up, because this is how I made a paper street map of downtown Manhattan, which also floats. Kind of. Stick around, it'll all make sense. So the first thing I need to make a street map of Manhattan is, well, a street map of Manhattan. For this, I'm using good old Google Maps. Now from this height I can't really see the roads very clearly, so I zoom in to sharpen up the street view. But not too close or else all those Starbuckses make the roads just as hard to see. Once I find the perfect height, I begin taking several screenshots of the areas in and around downtown Manhattan. I then take all those screenshots and stitch them together in some image editing software, I used PowerPoint, don't judge me, to create one giant map with very clear roads. The plan here is to print this thing out, but not before doing a little design work to it. So the first thing I do is make Manhattan Island a little more pleasing to the eye by rotating it vertically. I then start thinking about how big I want this thing to be when printed out. I decide I want my finished map to be mounted on a nice A2 sized background. So I place a one to one representation of an A2 page over an area of the map I like. I then place an outline of a thick border inside this rectangle to represent the start of the street map that I actually want to cut out. I'll be cutting out all the roads that attach to the inside border and then I'll mount the whole thing to an A2 background. Now I don't want to see any of these street markings on my finished map, so I flip the whole thing horizontally. I do this because, after I've cut the map out, I can unflip it to make the white, unprinted underside in actuality the correctly orientated map. Genius, I know. I've also made some other genius projects on my channel that you should definitely check out over here. <laughs> I then divide the map into quarters for printing out. This is because I know 1A2 is equal to 4A4s. And since my printer can only print on A4s, I deduce through the power of logic that this is the only way I could possibly print this map out. Each map quarter is then saved as its own A4 image, with a bit of the division lines included to help with lining up all the pages later. The quarters are then converted to black and white, because printer ink is an unholy affair of expensiveness, and then printed out onto some 200 gram cardstock. The thicker paper will just give the map some extra strength to stop it from bending so easily under its own weight. But with everything designed and printed out, it's time to start cutting. So starting with the first page, the first thing I do is redefine any obscure lines hidden by map text. I do this using a 0.35 mechanical pencil to get a really sharp line. Then I do a really unnecessary thing and start numbering all the blocks. You see, originally I wanted to use these cutouts to make another sort of 3D raised map thing, and numbering them would keep everything in order. But after seeing how long it took to just complete this map, I ultimately decided to scrap the idea. But not before numbering every single block. Also, side note. If you're wondering why I'm wearing gloves, it's because I don't want to dirty the paper by touching it with my naked hands all the time. Once all the lines of the first page have been clearly identified and unnecessarily numbered, I can finally begin cutting out the blocks. Now some blocks are quite small, so picking them up would be a challenge. My cunning solution was to use some adhesive putty on the end of a toothpick to snag them and then store them in this conveniently placed container. 
Of course, in the end, this wasn't even necessary because I only would have needed to do this if I was going to make that other map idea, which I wasn't. So you are literally watching a man waste his time. Hmm. Anyway, you'll notice I'm cutting all of this out freehand. I can cut a relatively straight line, so it's just faster this way. But I do occasionally use a metal ruler when some cuts just refuse to go where I want them to. But once I got into the groove of things, everything started moving along quite nicely. Actually, once I had accepted that this was indeed my life now and I have to live with the decisions I make, it even became quite therapeutic. If you ever find yourself doing something like this, I'd recommend you listen to a good YouTube series in the background. I listen to Map Men on Jay Foreman's channel, because evidently I like maps, and Jay Foreman is my spirit animal. Anyway, back to the project. Now, admittedly, there were a few times when I accidentally cut through a road, but not to worry. To fix this, I used a small drop of clear drying glue to reattach the part. I guarantee no one will ever know. Well, except you. So you have to keep it a secret, okay? But fast forward three days and 679 cutout blocks later, and the first page is complete. But you ain't seen nothing yet. As planned, I now flip the page over to reveal a correctly orientated map quarter in a beautifully crisp white finish. Basically magic, right? I gotta say, I really like it. And if you really like it too, why not give this video a like? Ho <laughs> ho, shameless plug. Also, if you're curious about these borders, don't be. I'll sort that out later. For now, I'm keeping them attached to make the page a little easier to handle. Also, also, here's a banana for scale. Now this has been fun, but lest we forget, there are still three more pages to do. So let's stop slacking and get cracking. And yes, I absolutely intended that to rhyme. Now because you already get the general idea, I'll speed through these next three pages. But basically, there was a lot of cutting out of small shapes, fixing accidentally cut through roads with glue, cutting out slightly bigger shapes, cutting out even bigger shapes, cutting out massive shapes, and then doing some line defining for a change of pace. As well as not forgetting to unnecessarily number all those blocks. Then it's back to cutting, cutting, cutting and cutting, until mercifully, the very last block is cut out. So, after two weeks of work, and following the cutting out of something close to 1,717 blocks, all of which were numbered for nothing, this is what I'm left with. Four crisp white map page segment things. But now for the part we've all been waiting for. I can now configure these pages into their proper positions, so we can get a glimpse of what the final map will look like. And Lord Nelson's trousers, it looks gorgeous. But I think you'll agree that these borders are getting in the way. So next up, I'm going to remove those borders and join the quarters together to make one giant paper street map of downtown Manhattan. So starting with the two pages that are at the bottom of the map, I carefully cut away their inner borders to show the ends of the roads. I'll leave the other borders attached for now, just to give the pages a little extra strength while I work on them. With the inner borders gone, I bring both pages together and line up the numerous rows with their corresponding counterparts. While doing this, I notice some rows have been bent out of shape when I cut the borders away, so I use some tweezers to carefully bend them back in position. Once everything has been corrected, I join the two pages together by placing a strip of tape over the spot where the top and the bottom borders meet. I then find any big rows that meet and join them with tape as well. This is just to keep everything in position while I join the smaller rows together, which I do by placing a drop of clear drying glue over the spot where they meet each other. Once the glue has dried, I inspect the joins and remove any scraggly imperfections with a knife. I then flip the page over and look at it from the side you'll actually see. As you can tell, the join is practically invisible, exactly as planned. I wasn't winging this at all. So that's the bottom two pages joined then. Now for the top two, which are joined in the same way. So that's a whole lot of border cutting, road inspecting, border taping, big road taping, small road gluing, and join cleaning until wow, look at that in a fraction of the time the top two pages are joined together amazing. Now I have to join this top section to the bottom section I made earlier, in plot twist, the exact same way, wow! 
So, blah, 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 borders, taping, gluing, subscribe to the Kyle Glendening YouTube channel, what, nothing, clean up, attach this little piece that I accidentally cut off, and done. With all four quarters of the map together, the last thing to do is trim down the whole outer border to its final size. You'll recall that this is the same border I made in the digital design earlier, but since we're here again, let's just take a moment to reflect on the journey thus far. What started out as a simple idea, well, kind of, has now become this. And as we pan across what is literally nothing more than some cut up paper, I'm reminded why I love design, why I love making. It's the realization that you really can create anything you want in life. You just have to chase it, that idea, that goal, that dream. But let's not get too emotional over here, we're not done yet. So with the paper street map cut out and assembled, next I can make the background that it attaches to. To stick with the whole paper theme, I decided to use some simple pieces of corrugated cardboard, which I've taped together, as my background material. I then went out and bought an A2 sheet of black paper to cover the join and to create a nice contrasting background for the white map. I attached the paper to the cardboard by first thoroughly coating it in glue from a good quality glue stick and then pressing it down firmly in place, making sure to work out any air pockets as I go. Once dry, I cut through the excess cardboard around the paper and then press it away to reveal the completed background. Now it's time to join this to the map, but here's the catch. I want to make it look like the map is floating above the background by creating a sort of shadow effect. To do that, next I'm going to make these things I'm calling spaces. The spaces will be made from double-sided foam tape, the advantages being it rises whilst simultaneously sticking the map to the background. Now the thickness of the tape is important. Too tall and the map will sag off the background. Too short and it won't create that floating shadow effect I'm after. I ended up using this 1mm thick black tape, which, spoiler, was a mistake, but more on that later. For now, to make the spaces, I first cut a strip of tape and lightly apply it to a hard, clean cutting surface. In my case, a metal ruler. This is so I have a hard but easy to remove surface to cut the spaces on. Next, I make several light cuts spaced 2mm apart along the tape. This is because I'll be attaching the spaces to the areas behind the roads, and 2mm is generally how wide the roads are. I then cut across these lines three times to create 80 rectangular spaces. I make so many because the more spaces there are to evenly distribute the map's weight, the smoother its surface will look. Next I gently peel off a spacer from the cutting surface using tweezers and carefully apply it to a road on the printed side of the map. I then peel off and apply the next spacer approximately 4cm away from this one, whilst avoiding putting any in the borders around the map for now. I continue attaching all the spaces in this way until the whole map is covered, and surprisingly it was actually really fun to do. Although admittedly my definition of fun may be warped slightly these days, still I thought I'd share it with you. Just like you should share this video with a friend, am I right? Hey! <laughs> anyway, concerning the borders, I cut those spaces slightly bigger, around 10mm squared, and positioned them approximately 8cm apart. I then flip the map right side up and place it on the background to check the spaces are supporting it evenly. Any sagging spots, like this one here, are fixed by placing an extra spacer underneath the area. With the application of the spaces complete, I took a moment to appreciate that floating effect it created. And it was around this point that I started to suspect that maybe the map wasn't quite high enough off the background. But did that stop me from continuing anyway? Absolutely not. So blindly ignoring my intuition, I flip the map over once again and begin removing the double-sided tape covers from the spaces using tweezers. Needless to say, this took a while. To add an extra layer of complexity, I had to avoid accidentally sticking myself to the map. 
I had to move something akin to a light breeze, gently conforming itself to the contours of a mighty Japanese mountain range. Obscure metaphors aside, and all the covers are removed, I can now attach the background to the map. Now I don't want to risk moving the map in this delicate state, so instead I'm going to lower the background onto it. To make sure I attach the background perfectly centered to the map, I came up with this idea of using four strips of paper to act as a sort of visual guide to help me keep the background square to the map whilst I lowered it in place. So I take the background, black side face down, and slowly lower it in place, making sure to keep the distance to the four guides equal as I descend. Once the background makes contact with the spaces, I'm committed. I then apply gentle but firm pressure to make sure all the spaces are attached. Then, with the anticipation of a small child at Christmas, I flip the background over to look upon my handiwork. And surprisingly, it turned out perfectly. Everything had gone exactly as I planned. I was finally happy. Except that I wasn't. Upon closer inspection, as I had initially feared, the map just wasn't spaced high enough to substantially create that floating shadow effect I was after, which was kind of the point of this entire project. So, overcome by failure, I did the only thing I knew how. But after that, motivated to try, try again, I grab my knife and begin cutting through all my beloved spaces. To get to the harder to reach areas of the map, I improvise a longer knife by attaching a knife blade to my ruler. Now obviously this is dangerous for several reasons, but you gotta do what you gotta do. Once all the spaces had been cut through, I carefully remove the map and set it aside. To remove the leftover foam from the background, I carefully scrape it off with a blunt knife, and do the same thing for the foam left over on the map, except with like double the amount of anxiety. And so, with everything back to how it was, it's time for round two this time with much thicker double-sided foam tape, a whole three millimeters to be precise. And now it's pretty much business as before. Step one, cut several dozen two millimeter wide rectangular spaces from the double-sided foam tape. Step two, attach the spaces to the map using tweezers and place them approximately four centimeters apart. Step three, follow Kyle Glendinning on Instagram at Kyle Glendinning. I hear he's a really great guy and also super humble about it. Step 4. Cut out 10mm squared spaces for the borders and place those 8cm apart. Step 5. Remove the protective covering from the tape spaces and make sure not to accidentally stick yourself to the- Damn it, Kyle! Step 6. Assemble your visual reference guides, then lower the background face down onto the spaces. Step 7. Once contact is made, press down firmly, say a prayer, and then flip it over. Step 8. Breathe. Take a step back and feast your eyes upon the shadow play that is this map. This time, I am much happier with the spacer height. That subtle shadow effect really gives this piece a little extra flair, something you just don't get from a regular map. And it's just enough to make a passerby stop and say, Oh hey, that's a nice map. Wait, is it... is it floating? Oh wow. And so, after three weeks of work and over 1,717 parts cut out by hand, I can finally mount this thing on my wall, step back, and say my floating street map of downtown Manhattan is complete. As you know, this whole piece is sized to that of an A2. So if we do a scale conversion, then this map is to a scale of 1 to 20,000, which means that 1 centimeter on the map is equal to 20,000 centimeters in real life. To commemorate this, as well as all the other facts of the project, I make a plaque to mount beneath the work as a reminder to all the tedious fun I had creating this thing. And if you too had fun following along, then please do stick around for the next one. A good way to do that is by clicking that subscribe button, as well as the bell so you can stay informed about all my future uploads. But in all seriousness, thank you so much for watching this whole thing. It really means a lot. I had so much fun making this and would love to share more of my making adventures with you. So if you have any questions, criticisms, or possibly even a compliment, then please do post them in the comment section and I'll meet you there for a party. That all said, get out there and be ambitiously creative. The world needs your imagination. As for me, I've got some pancakes to make. So until next time, cheerio.